All right, everybody, time for Mindhunter Season 1, Episode 3. Let's do it. In the first scene, Holden and Tench go to meet Wendy for the first time, and we see how Wendy is very intellectual. She's steeped in academia. She's also very formal and uh, controlled. Uh, she doesn't really say anything that isn't measured in some way. She talks about how her primary job has been studying psychopaths, but she actually uses some wrong terminology because she says psychopaths, but essentially she's been studying narcissists because she's talking about men who are titans of industry and who rise to the top of organizations. That's not exactly what a psychopath or a sociopath is. Uh, a sociopath tends to be a little bit different and more along the lines of the men that hold an intention or interviewing that are in prison. But either way, narcissists and sociopaths or psychopaths are people who have little to no empathy, don't care about the feelings of others, are only interested in uh, their own accomplishments, uh, forms of power, power over other people, uh, people submitting to their power. Holden's getting very excited by what Wendy is proposing in terms of uh, a possible book and expanding, doing a lot of research. I just can't stop thinking about this project. Dr. Carr said it could have far-reaching consequences. Why are you up? Did you smoke my pot? I just can't stop thinking about this project. The idea is so exciting. He's excited, but he's not really understanding the details of what this is going to mean. And she wants to formalize everything and make it into an academic study, which really doesn't fit with his way of doing these interviews. And we're going to see how that tension is going to build itself up throughout the season in the disparity between how Holden does things more naturally and organic and how academics do their type of study. We see how important it is for Holden and Tench to kind of communicate about things and work off of each other when they're looking into these cases, when they go back to Sacramento to investigate another attack and this one a fatality. They're trying to go through the profiling and they're naming off characteristics and they each provide a different perspective but it's almost like the opposite perspective is what allows the other to get to a better idea of where they're going. But at least late 20s. Physically mature, emotionally immature, socially undeveloped, possibly still lives at home? Narcotics, maybe. That's why he beat her this badly. Didn't know when to stop. You think? Why not? Not if he still lives at home, but maybe he's married. Or separated? Separated. And so, as opposed to one of them doing it by themselves, the two of them are in synchronicity with each other and really help uh, get to an, a better idea of what they're looking for quicker. They go to interview a possible suspect, somebody that matches the description of the type of person they're looking for. And they go into the house and they talk to his mom and it's a just a terrible woman, somebody who is vicious with her words and is denigrating this man all the time and making him feel less than probably for much of his life. Gigi basically just wants to get rid of her son and that's probably one of the hardest things for this guy to have to deal with. Uh, his mom hates him. They take the guy outside and Tench says, nice lady, real maternal. And so we just have another reference back to the parental dynamics and how that obviously affects a lot of characters in the show. As the interview proceeds, we find out that Dwight, the suspect, doesn't like his mom's dog, and he really doesn't like his mom's new boyfriend that moved in, and he's pretty frustrated and irritated by all these goings-ons in his nice, comfortable house. You ever been in a fight? Me? But not with mom. Right? Mom's different. You only have one mom. Never laid a finger on her. You didn't even raise a hand to her. Of course not. You raise a hand to your mom, it all goes to shit, right? They eventually get him to crack, and they do it through the use of understanding his unconscious psychology. And they're basically laying it out to him. Yeah, you're never going to hurt your mom because you love your mom too much, but you will unconsciously project your anger 
and your displeasure onto other old ladies and other old ladies with similar dogs that are easier targets. And this is a form of projection. It's a form of displacement. And it's really showing how the unconscious of this individual and many of the criminals in the show is what is controlling their lives and their actions. And so they're getting to this point with these investigations of realizing how the unconscious is the thing that they need to be investigating and that the unconscious is the best starting point because if you go from the conscious viewpoint of each individual, you get lost in their idiosyncrasies and specific parts of who they are, whereas the unconscious is more collective. It's more patterned and it has more relations to other people that you can kind of make a diagram out of and figure out solutions to problems a lot easier. Afterwards, what they're all drinking at the police department and they're celebrating the capture of this guy, the the man that they've been corresponding with talks about how they're basically like psychics. And in a way they are because when you're looking into the unconscious of an individual, you're seeing into them and seeing parts of them that they are not even aware of and that most people are not aware of. And that's a, a sort of a psychic ability, I would say. Holden responds by saying, We can venture into the blackest night and shine a light on the darkness. And he's using a great metaphor there for we need to shine a light on the unconscious and on the dark side of the psyche. And that's how we're going to expose things and bring the things to light and bring realizations and insights to ourselves and to people around us. Then when they get back to the hotel room, Tench calls his wife and Holden is lying awake with his eyes open listening and we're seeing how he is kind of seen into a little bit of the dark side of Tench's life in that Perhaps Tench is celebrating and having a good time that night, you know, making the case, but his family life is all out of sorts, and this is a big part of his story that we're going to start getting into as time goes on. They go back to talk to Ed Kemper, and at one point he talks about the need to feel powerful in a way by the women being dead and him being alive and the pleasure that he got out of that. And it makes us think of the beyond the pleasure principle, which Holden brings up in the first episode. But a lot of this male masculine psychology that Kemper seems to identify with and the need to dominate victims and uh, triumph over them. And that, that makes him probably feel some type of immortality or some type of invigoration including the feeling of sexual pleasure which he seemed to get out of those experiences you know it all really goes back to my perceived inability to communicate socially sexually i was scared to death of failing in male female relationships even sitting down to talk to a young lady but this also sides with what he's telling us about the inability to communicate with women and not really knowing how to be with them and so not learning any of those social tools it seems like his adaptation was to gain control and power over them but this all goes back to his unconscious as well because his mother was terrible to him and didn't give him the ability to communicate with her and to form a relationship with her. And so his adaptation as a child was to be the dominator and to be the controller. He could never be vulnerable with women, so he had to choose the other side. And then when he talks about killing his mother, he says that he put her vocal cords in the garbage disposal as a way to shut her up permanently and it's a very literal way of doing it but he was never able to do it any other way throughout his life and 
it seems like a fitting end to their relationship after the amount of dominance and power she held over him for so long. This seemed to be the way that he finally gets his power back himself. Holden goes home to meet with his girlfriend and he talks about how he can't let the the people he's interviewing rub off on him because of the ways that they view sex and the ways that they view women. And he immediately uh, attempts to go down on her while she's filing her nails. And so we're seeing Holden play into that submissive male role that we've already started talking about. And maybe that's part of the reason he doesn't want them to rub on if, uh, rub off on him because they're more on the aggressive masculine side of things and that's not what he's like himself but again Holden because of the way that he is is also a very open-minded person and is more progressive and so when he talks to one of the other professors about getting rid of the deviant terminology the guy kind of gives him a weird look like who is this guy and what is he into? And then when he's going through the list with one of the secretaries, she's questioning every one of the words he wants to take off the list. And they think it's very strange, but he's saying, you know, times have changed and we need to move forward. And that's one of the benefits of being an open-minded person, changing from the past and moving towards a future that's different and new. Then near the end of the episode, Tench mentions how Holden didn't really care about Tench getting on board or even their uh, their supervisor being on board with the project. But when the Foxy professor gets on board, he's all excited. Just when he has something not sexual, maybe a little sexual, but her ideas and her energy. She, I sound like an idiot. You sound like you have a crush on teachers. Just- and they're continuing to get at Holden's admiration for women and kind of his subjugation of himself to women overall and how he identifies more with those feminine energies and moves away from the masculine energies that Tench might be more of an example of. Well, that's it for Mindhunter Season 1, Episode 3. Episode 4, coming up soon. Thank you for watching.